Lithium prices are up tenfold since the start of the decade. That, according to Benchmark Minerals Assessment, is the metal set for a drop. I'm with Chris Perry. He's president of House Mountain Partners. Chris, welcome back to Kitco. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be back. Where are we with lithium prices? There has been some reports of some softening, Chris. A little bit. And, you know, look, the, the softening of the price is not a huge surprise. Uh, to your point, depending upon when you started tracking lithium prices, I mean, they're up 10x, 9x, whatever. Uh, I would argue that the likelihood that uh, you see a 10x in lithium pricing out over the next two years, uh, just like we've seen over the previous two years, is obviously very unlikely. I would argue that in 2023, um, lithium prices are likely to stagnate and whether or not we're talking about battery grade lithium or battery grade carbonate or of course spodumene concentrate um, I, I and look that's not a bad thing uh, especially after the run we've had I, I do not think this is sort of a classic you know pump and dump cycle I think the demand overall for lithium going out to 2030 is is really defensible and and very strong and so I think that's probably why I wouldn't be at all surprised just in 2023 to see lithium really be range bound from a price perspective. Maybe there's a little bit of downside, but by no means will we see the collapse that some banks are forecasting. Now, Chris, uh, this is a little bit unusual. I mean, if we went back uh, half a dozen years ago, I think you could consider lithium as um, how would you say a little bit more esoteric. Uh, but, um, you know, it's really run up and uh, it seems to be just uh, carrying on strength, whereas you're used to other metals. I don't know, a zinc, tin, a copper. They kind of have their moment in the sun and then they kind of come down again. And look, lithium has had its moments in the sun in the past. This is the third lithium cycle that I've lived through in my career. Um, all of the cycles have one thing in common. They have a definitive beginning and end. I would argue what is different in the current cycle is that lithium demand is growing at 20% per year. Uh, I think it's actually going to grow at 20% per year out to 2030. Whereas in previous cycles, lithium was really only growing demand, I should say, was growing at about maybe five or six or 7% per year. So, um, the issue is this isn't just a traditional investment cycle driven by investors and corporates. Also, governments are involved now as well. Um, going back, because um, uh, uh, you've been through these cycles, and then I think about um, rare earth, um, and then again, you were talking about the spikes in lithium. So just to uh, emphasize uh, why we think that this is going to be sustained is this is that you see like the major automakers making the investment. There seems to be a real turn by consumers right now that they're actually embracing uh, electric vehicles. There's also what is happening broader in terms of energy transition. All of these things kind of make it real in terms of uh, there being a need for lithium. Is that correct, Chris? That's absolutely right. I mean, automotive manufacturers who didn't really think they had to worry about lithium accessibility, say, four or five years ago, now obviously have have gotten religion for lack of a better phrase and have realized that okay this is a very important issue and they're willing to make multi million or multi hundred million dollar bets over the course of this decade to lock in supply the other the other reason i think why lithium is important is when you think about the cost of that lithium even at today's spot prices of eighty thousand dollars the cost of that lithium in an electric vehicle is maybe 14 to 15 percent of the cost of the overall ev so it's not um, it's not sort of a make or break thing. In other words, I think that automotive manufacturers, while they don't want to pay current prices, they are willing to do that to lock in supply for the next five or six years because the lithium is a relatively small overall cost of the electric vehicle. Who's going to benefit, Chris? Um, who are the uh, short to medium term producers? Um, maybe also uh, identify some companies that should be expanding production. Sure. I mean, look, any any lithium producer that's in production today and expanding capacity um, is, in my view, probably sold out of material right through 2025. So the obvious players like Albemarle, Livent, uh, Mineral Resources, SQM, those are those are obvious uh, benefactors of the current lithium pricing environment. Some of the near term players like Lithium Americas, Sigma Lithium, Core Lithium, or AMG, also down in Brazil, um, who are forecast to come on, or I should say scheduled to come on, uh, enter into production in 2023 and into 2024, you know, subject to any bumps in the roads with, with getting into commissioning, um, they should do very well as well. 
You gave another uh, interview, uh, Chris, and I'll call it out uh, with uh, Joe Lowry's uh, Lithium podcast. And uh, the one thing that uh, struck me when uh, you had the interview was uh, the um, mentioning um, uh, mentioning a three word phrase over and over again. That, that was the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. How important uh, was this uh, act uh, to uh, the lithium industry, Chris? I think it's vital. Um, you, you would not see any of the battery metals, not just lithium, but any of the battery metals or the supply chain. Um, get built, I think, as quickly as it's going to be built without the Inflation Reduction Act in place. And in addition to that, at least here in the United States, you also have the Bipartisan um, Infrastructure Act, which has which has dispersed about $2.7 billion uh, across a number of different battery technologies and infrastructure plays as well. So there is just in the United States, never mind what's happening in China, never mind what's happening in the European Union with their own similar programs. Um, a huge, huge uh, fiscal impulse, I guess, in terms of accelerating the build out of, of these supply chains. And so, again, that's that's very, very beneficial, I would argue, in particular uh, for the upstream portion of the supply chain. The one challenge with the IRA is that it doesn't directly address mining or mine permitting. OK, so, you know, there is still this mismatch in the supply chain where you can build a lithium conversion facility or even a battery gigafactory in a matter of two to three to four years, depending upon the size and the capacity. But, you know, you're still sort of stuck with it taking anywhere from seven to probably more than 10 years to bring Greenfield's battery metal supply on stream here in North America. And so that's that's a core issue, I think, in terms of accelerating this transition. Uh, there's uh, two camps, so Chris, uh, that uh, are looking at this. Uh, so um, I think there's um, there's a people on the one side that think uh, with innovation, with the uh, price that we have now, that uh, supply is going to increase and it's going to increase quickly. So there's uh, what's happening with uh, the lithi uh, direct lithium extraction, for example. Uh, my favorite word to say, lipidolite. Uh, and mm. then uh, they're also, and then the camps, I would say along those would be uh, your Goldman Sachs, your McKinsey's who are optimistic on some of these solutions coming to the fore. Um, then there's the other camp, I would think kind of uh, like uh, Benchmark Minerals, for instance, who see that there's going to be kind of a real bottleneck. It seems like people that are closer to the coal face uh, that are there are uh, being a lot more realistic. And then they're seeing if there's any, any innovation, it's going to be very incremental. Um, who's right on this, Chris? Look, I think there's there's probably elements of, of truth or reality in, in both forecasts. I mean, supply is going to increase, again, coming primarily from major players that I mentioned before, the Albemarle's and the SQM's of the world. Uh, it's one thing to, to mine and produce lithium. It is almost an entirely other, uh, more complex issue to produce battery grade lithium and do so at scale. Again, when the lithium business was growing at five or six or seven percent per year, the majors could handle this. Okay. Now that it's growing much, much faster again, and, and my forecast, as I laid out before, is 20 percent per year out to 2030. Um, the majors alone cannot handle this. And so that means that you're going to have to bring in new players some of which have, let's just say, limited experience in producing battery grade material at scale. And so what that means is it doesn't mean that we're in sort of a perpetual deficit, although I, I think that's pretty likely. Um, it just means that there's going to be a great deal of volatility in this space going forward as well. And in volatility is, quite frankly, where you can make the money. The water issue uh, with um, the uh, Solar operations down in the vital, important um, uh, Latin American operations is um, is... Is the water usage and the way that they actually operate those operations, is, is that an existential threat to those miners down there? I wouldn't say it's an existential threat uh, to the lithium miners in particular. I think it's a real challenge to the mining business in general. Um, you know, you ha don't forget that we're also going to need a great deal more copper and, and other metals as well. So, um, you know, lithium or water use in lithium, I would argue, is not not a single major issue, but I would argue that when you compound that with the amount of water used in copper mining, for example, in places like Chile, uh, it does become an issue. And so to your point earlier, Michael, you talked about DLE and, you know, there are groups out there that think that uh, it's the savior of the industry. Um, you know, DLE is not a monolithic technology. It's not one size fits all. Uh, you will have different direct lithium extraction technologies across different types of, of brines, oil field, uh, brom bromine, whatever it is, 
Um, but having said all, all of that, I would think that even by 2030, um, if every DLE project that I'm tracking today uh, is in production by 2030, sort of feasibility level today gets in production by 2030, it still would only be about 15% of global lithium production by 2030. So again, not enough to upend the cost curve or tip the scales into over oversupply. Certainly, agi is necessary. There has uh, been a, a series of headlines in uh, 2022 uh, talking about uh, cars uh, making uh, car companies rather making uh, big investments in um, uh, in either um, investing in building electrical cars or signing off take agreements. Now you said that there's a real dearth in terms of these materials that are out there. Is there any car company, though, that you can identify or say that uh, may be well placed uh, on supply that uh, may be, um, you know, may, may, be, may be better situated? Uh, well, look, Tesla was way ahead of everybody in terms of locking up supply. So let's put them to the side for a second. Look at other major automotive manufacturers. I think it's going to be really, really um, tight for a lot of these OEMs to hit their stated EV goals by 2025. I was uh, at uh, in San Diego a couple of weeks ago at an automotive battery conference, and all of the major players were there, Ford and General Motors and VW. And, you know, when these guys speak publicly in front of roomfuls of people, what, what they're now saying is we're covered until 2025, okay? Not covered indefinitely, but covered until 2025. And so that begs the question, well, if it takes 10 years to bring a new mine on stream, Every new automotive manufacturer, every automotive manufacturer on the planet is electrifying their fleet. What happens after 2025? I mean, that's where the whole supply, you know, deficit or supply uh, demand argument. I think it's really, really interesting. So, you know, to come back to your question, I would argue, I think that you know, some some automotive manufacturers will probably be okay, but I think it's going to be really, really tight because a lot of these guys who should have been making these investments several years ago are just now making them. And again, it takes time to bring this material on stream. One good example, General Motors and Livent. Uh, General, I believe it's General Motors, has agreed to pay Livent about 198 million US dollars uh, in the form of a prepayment for lithium availability starting in 2025. And so that just sort of tells me, again, that major automotive manufacturers, this one in particular, have really woken up to the fact that, okay, electrification is real, consumers are behind it, governments are behind it, and we as a corporation need to get behind it as well. And it all starts with security of supply of raw material. So that's a that's a very, very notable investment. We talk to um, a lot of juniors uh, that uh, have um, exposure or that they're developing projects in uh, the critical metal space, uh, whether it's going to be cobalt, uh, whether it's going to be nickel, whether it's going to be manganese. Um, but um, you said uh, one uh, impact of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is that battery, battery chemistry could get simpler. Could you explain? Yeah, I, I just, I, I mean, I'm not even, I'm not sure if it's necessarily uh, um a direct result of the Inflation Reduction Act, but if you're a purchasing manager at a battery manufacturer and you're thinking about, okay, do I want to go higher energy density with nickel, manganese, cobalt, or perhaps a lower energy density with LFP? Obviously, with NMC, I've got to source nickel, manganese, cobalt, obviously lithium, whereas with LFP, it's just a, it's a much more straightforward procurement process. Uh, and the other interesting thing is that when you look at what's happening in China in particular with companies like S-Volt or BYD or CATL, their state-of-the-art LFP actually, I think, is very, very competitive with sort of run-of-the-mill NMC technology. And so I would argue that as, as EV adoption continues apace and it's not as foreign, I think it is, as it is to a lot of people today, you're likely to see the issues around range anxiety melt away. And what that means is LFP in particular is going to become a much more popular technology for, um, for, for automotive in particular than it is today. And that's been one of the biggest changes we've seen in the last couple of years in this space. 
Uh, lastly, Chris, um, let's uh, just talk about uh, Canada. I, I've noticed there's been a real cultural difference between Australia and uh, Canada. And um, Australia seems to have been, um, how would you say, uh, they're much more bullish. Uh, they're much more aggressive in uh, the battery metal space. I, I think of uh, the fight, for instance, uh, for Norant uh, resources and uh, that nickel project uh, in Ontario. Uh, that was uh, between Wailu and uh, BHP, uh, which was um, kind of one of uh, the biggest uh, biggest fights that uh, we saw in uh, the mining space, never mind uh, the tie up with uh, Oz Minerals uh, that looks like it's uh, proceeding right now. Uh, how well, um, how well um, uh, resource laden or how rich is Canada right now in terms of uh, the lithium space do you see? Uh, tremendously, you know, blessed and, and resource laden with lithium. Again, you know, lithium is not rare. Uh, there have been a number of examples of, of I guess, past attempts at producing hard rock lithium uh, in Canada. You know, Namaska is obviously, I think, the most recent example from from uh, booms and busts of the past. But um, no, I, I think when you think about the the quality and the amount of lithium resource in particular in Canada, and then overlay the potential for the Inflation Reduction Act to help accelerate some of those investments and some bringing some of those assets on stream, uh, Canada is very, very well placed. Chris, thanks for speaking with Kitco. You bet. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate the opportunity. He's Chris Berry. He is president of House Mountain Partners. My name is Michael McCray. You're watching Kitco Mining. <laughs>